Welcome everyone to AZ Bio Peers. Our session today is focusing on healthcare. Not the healthcare that we, our innovations help to support, but the healthcare that our employees need so that they stay healthy and productive. And we're thrilled to have the team from Mercer today. And um, with us is Leanna Pachter and Jen Cordes. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Leanna and she's gonna kick us off. All right, thank you so much, Joan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome from her hello from the nation's capital. Um, my name is Leanna Pachter. I'm an associate at Mercer Health and Benefits. Um, previously worked in internal HR uh, at a nonprofit here in DC. Um, and I really love hearing from and working with HR professionals um, and folks in my role. Um, Jen, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. I know they have our, our bio, but Happy to. Well, good morning. Um, I am not in the nation's capital, nor am I in Arizona, but I am in the great state of Tennessee in Nashville. And, um, you know, my role is the multiple employer solution leader. So I work with associations and other groups that want to collectively purchase or offer, um, in my case, specifically health insurance to their members. And uh, it, prior to this role, um, I'm actually an employee benefits attorney. So though I focus solely on health insurance today, I've had a long career of working in, we'll, we'll dabble a little bit in um, retirement. We'll talk a little bit about some employment trends. All of that's in my background as well, but looking forward to uh, sharing with you towards the end, the focus on what Arizona uh, Bio is bringing to you all as far as the the health insurance solution. So Leanne, I'm gonna kick it back to you and we can get yep. started. All right. So it sounds like um, today we wanted to talk a little bit about total rewards and trends. What are the major topics and concerns in HR when it comes to career and the employee experience? Um, so three major areas, career, health, and wealth. Um, uh, career being the employee experience, health being benefits, so what Jen and I um, work with on a daily basis, and then, of course, wealth, the financial wellness that your, your staff um, is really looking for and the direction from you as well. So we love data at Mercer. There's a lot of data in this presentation. Um, it's really interesting, but I'll be sure to add some anecdotal information throughout, and Jen, of course, will do the same if, if, um, if anything, if anything uh, sparks for her. All right, so we'll start with um, a little bit of market context and background. Um, can't, can't have a presentation these days without talking about COVID, so we're just going to do it right from the, right the get-go. Um, so COVID set uh, an unprecedented shock to the labor market last year, uh, pushed unemployment to near record highs, resulting in millions of workers leaving the workforce. Uh, but in the most recent months, we're seeing the U.S. enter a period of supercharged growth. Um, a need for employers to staff up. So you'll see this reflected in the record-breaking spike with 10 million jobs opening last month. In the earlier stages of the pandemic, uh, employers really experienced severe attrition and turnover just with the uncertainty of the pandemic, um, employee satisfaction, how are employers handling the crisis. Um, but now that that, but that commitment you know, needs to still be important at the forefront, and turnover is still increasing, uh, levels reaching 10-year highs in recent months. Uh, so this is a major complaint, concern, fear that I'm hearing from my clients in small to mid-market size. So that's anywhere from 100 employees all the way up to 5,000, 8,000. Um, this is the big thing that I'm hearing and nationally with our, with our peers, Jen and I, um, our, our understanding that this is the, the major concern right now is just attrition, turnover, keeping talent within. Um, so not helpful, but a little helpful to know that this is a national issue, that everyone is kind of going through this. Um, and unfortunately, the Delta variant is not making things um, any more certain. Um, but it's a good opportunity for employers to pay attention to the concerns for health and safety that their employees are really interested in and concerned about. So it, it almost is an opportunity um, for growth and uh, development for employers, which we'll talk about. So how are employers responding? Uh, based on our survey data, you can see that um, the actions that employers are taking to respond to the labor shortage um, range in variety. So some are enhancing the workplace flexibility. So maybe employers that would have been 
previously a little bit less likely to allow remote work situations or flexible working arrangements are recognizing and realizing that this is this is the key to the future. This is the future of work and what has to be done. Um, I've also heard anecdotally from some clients that they're having um, folks turn down offers if they if candidates get a sense in the interview process that they're that the employer is not valuing remote work. So um, again, it's something that candidates are aware of. It's something that employers are aware of. Um, so it's definitely um, a future trend to be on top of. Um, Reevaluating compensation and benefits. Um, so this is really where Mercer can come into play uh, for our clients is, is helping them to reassess their compensation strategy. Are they aligned to their values? And then benefits, of course, um, are they paying attention to the different compliance changes and things that are going on with, with COVID um, in order to make their benefits as robust as possible? Um, and then one more on here, um, investing in DE and I, so diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the last year has been fairly tumultuous in the U.S. Uh, as it pertains to race relations and just overall equality in the country. Um, so we have also seen a large, large percentage of our clients wanting to do more, be better, be more involved when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and this has been an area that Mercer has put a lot of time and effort into uh, to, to provide resources to our clients. So these are just some of the major areas of focus, mental health, all the things that you would probably be, um, you know, be guessing. Uh, we've also seen a huge, huge increase in telemedicine services, which I'm sure you all are fairly familiar with. Um, but telemedicine has just um, grown in a way that I don't think I don't think anyone was prepared for. So that's been pretty interesting to see. All right. So what are some considerations as you plan your response? Um, again, these are things that small employers, large employers need to be considering, um, different, different areas of, of focus. So if applicable, if you do have hourly workers, Mercer is really recommending that you prioritize your hourly workforce. Um, these are the folks that are on the front lines throughout the pandemic, continuing to remain on the front lines. And if we're facing another COVID resurgence, these are the folks that are going to be most critically impacted um, by, by the next wave. So um, most disruption, most churn happening here. So want to reevaluate um, what this workforce looks like for you, give them per particular attention. Uh, we believe, secondly, it's critical to seek out sources of differentiation in your employee value proposition. Um, so achieved through employee listening and understanding to the needs of your customers. So thinking of your employees also as, as you would with, with customers um, through techniques commonly used in consumer market research. So if this is the first time that you maybe are considering doing a survey or if you've you know, done one before, really taking this as an opportunity to um, dig, dig deep into what your employees and their families are looking for. Um, uh, in order to to make sure that you're you're growing with with the next stage, taking advantage of this disruption and this unprecedented uh, period that we're going through, um, and I put a, a square around that one because I think out of the things for for bio and the members and everything, this is probably the one that you can really dig into uh, pretty deeply. And then last but not least, taking a multifaceted approach kind of sounds obvious, but <laughs> making sure that you're being um, agile with the market, um, considering quick actions and longer term solutions, but also being flexible. Um, if you have to kind of go back and change something that you're saying as it pertains to return to work and all of all of that, um, recognizing that we all are rolling with this as best we can. <laughs> all right, so innovating through the eyes of your customer, um, not being trapped in the race to the middle, seeking to identify value creators, through the lens of your workforce. A lot of buzzwords there, but really what it's trying to say um, is that, again, taking advantage of the disruption that we're all experiencing. So these demographic shifts, aging workforce, new generations, increased diversity and uh, attention in diversity, plus the pandemic. So life and work values are shifting and changing. People have new stressors. There's a focus on um, you know, flexibility and things like that in, in the workplace. And then again, meeting and matching those unmet needs of your workforce. So what's keeping folks from being their best? What are the things that are giving uh, people kind of heartburn as they're trying to do their jobs and go about their daily life? And then how can, how can employers be the, the change agent there? 
So again, this is this is the I think out of those three, those three kind of navigation tips, I think this is the the biggest one that um, is most applicable to all employers, and I think particular to to the group that we we have here today. All right. So as we accelerate to the new shape of work, the future of work, what are we going to see? Um, Mercer is uh, clearly seeing that skills uh, are the key area of focus. Um, so jobs are changing. The nature of jobs are changing. The focus of technology in the workplace is changing. So again, more data. I told you we love data. So we've got a couple more points here. Um, so transformation is on the docket for everyone as we come into 2020, the rest of 2021 and into 2022. So giving your employees the opportunity to upskill, reskill, and redeploy skills that they already have. Um, so adapt jobs that you currently have, rethink how can, how can you merge two roles that currently exist separately, but maybe uh, hybridize them together. Um, and where are there areas where your employees and workforce is lacking? How can you be that change agent to enhance their, their career development um, and then by, by product enhancing your, your workplace? Um, capital is a concern, of course, uh, with the last year being a little difficult on the market. Um, so we recognize that not all organizations have the capital to be able to invest in their employees in this way. Um, but just at least being aware of it and being attuned to it, um, helping the village raise the village. Uh, if there's opportunities for other employees to teach other employees skills, um, you know, being being open to doing things like that in order to to save save costs. Um, and then, of course, not being resistant to change. I think that's the other big thing. Uh, just being alert and aware and awake to opportunities where your employees can grow and develop, again, in order to make your organization better. Um, let's see, next one. All right, so we talked a little bit about career there. So those are some of the major trends that we're seeing in career, some of the major areas to consider and, and be attentive to uh, as you're thinking about your workforce plan. Um, Health is the one thing that uh, that Jen, like I said, Jen and I focus in focus in and on day in and day out. Um, so we'd like to talk a little bit about our national survey of employer sponsored health plans. Uh, so these are these are, this is the data that we put out for 2020. Um, so it's reflective of employers' data in the past. So just a little bit about our national survey. It's a very long running survey. Um, it marks 36 years of measuring health plan trends. Fairly robust. We get anywhere from um, 1,500 to 2,000 employers to participate each year. 2020, we got a little over 1,800 folk, uh, employers to participate. Really comprehensive. The survey covers a lot of questions, um, a lot of different areas of health and benefits issues and strategies, um, not just your typical PPOs and things like that. We cover HRAs. We cover dental. Um, we make sure we get into some of those more nuanced questions. Um, it's statistically valid, <laughs> important in the data science, um, and then all different sizes, industries, and regions. So um, we also can slice and dice the data that we have really well, uh, and that's also been, you know, I've noticed uh, in my time at Mercer that's been really helpful to my clients is to say, hey, you know, I want to look at other DC metro employers, or we're thinking of growing into the California area. What what are you seeing on the West Coast? Um, so this is this is a huge advantage that we have to um, to conducting this survey year over year, um, and then three different employer size groups: so small, mid-sized, and large. So some of the major takeaways from our 2020 results: um, so despite economic uncertainty, relatively few employers uh, took 2020 as an opportunity or 2021 as an opportunity to cost shift uh, to shift costs over to employees. Um, they actually chose to kind of keep things fairly steady. Um, so I think that was not surprising because, of course, employers realize that um, their staff has encountered financial hardship and difficulty in the last year. Um, but I think we all kind of expected it to be um, more, of, more of a shift and we saw less of a shift. So that was, that was something that I found from, from the results this year uh, to be particularly interesting. And again, a lot of these these data points are stemming from things that you probably know intuitively that you'd think would be happening in the workplace. Um, but that's the beauty of our survey is that it gives the 
data points to back up kind of what we're all thinking and feeling that's happening in, in the workforce. Um, and I, I really enjoy whenever I get the chance to, to share this data with, with folks. Um, some employers we saw change the plan design to make healthcare more affordable. Um, so adding and planning uh, plan design to improve affordability was, was an area that we definitely saw, particularly in the smaller employer space. Um, and then again, in that mid-size range, shifting costs over to employees, smaller size employers recognizing that cost shifting over to employees probably wouldn't be the wisest choice. Um, we also saw that many employers are adding or expanding resources to provide support. Um, so that would be that darker teal, uh, that darker teal bar. Um, so in the larger space, 5,000 or more employees, using the capital that they have or the savings that they had to expand or add benefits or resources, um, whereas our smaller employers um, probably did the, did the absolute best that they could, which we're, we're super happy to see, um, but that our, our larger employers kind of stepped it up a little bit there. We also saw that um, employers saw opportunity in a crisis. So five, I'm just going to move this out of the way, uh, five ways that we saw employers reinventing health programs. So putting behavioral health on equal footing with physical health, um, enhancing mental health benefits, enhancing telemedicine opportunities, maybe lowering the co-payments and things like that uh, whenever possible to, to make it more accessible, even enhancing employee assistance programs. So I've actually seen a lot of my clients go out to market for EAP or employee assistance programs uh, to try to find a more robust offering for their, for their staff. Um, also, um, unfortunately, a lot of employers are seeing deaths at fairly high rates. Um, you know, maybe if it's a, a, work, a workforce that isn't, um, isn't super keen on getting the vaccine or maybe an, an aging population, whatever it might be, the employee assistance program is uh, really a great way to provide support um, and, and care to employees in the community to make sure that mental health isn't suffering collectively when there's, there's distress. Um, we've seen that employers are acknowledging racial health disparities and taking actions to address them. Uh, so Mercer's had a couple of different events, uh, public and also for internal clients, where we talk about this. So if, if any of you are interested in, in learning more, I'm more than happy to send over some resources. Um, and then other things that we kind of already touched on, virtual health care, uh, putting, putting that as a key focus, and balancing cost management to affordability, reshaping health engagement strategies to fit flexible working. Okay. And then, um, so this, this is from a little bit earlier in the year when we published the survey, um, but just wanted to, wanted to share with you all. So for employers in the 50 to 499 uh, population space, we saw that earlier in the year, they were administering temperature screening on site, requiring employee self-assessment and verification. So through an app or through any other sort of self-reporting opportunity, um, administering a symptom questionnaire on site, contact tracing, all different ways that employers were trying to keep their staff safe at work. Um, we also just recently came out with uh, some great statistics and information on how, how prevalent is it where we're seeing employers um, offer vaccinations on site, require vaccin vaccinations on site, um, offer any sort of incentive for folks to step away from the work day to go get vaccinated um, or um, bonuses for folks that already have have taken taken advantage of the vaccine. So um, again, another thing that we have information on, um, it just it just came out. <laughs> um, so I can send this over to to uh, to Joan if anyone's interested uh, to see more information on how employers are responding to the vaccine. And last but not least, we'll talk a little bit about wealth, specifically through the lens of defined contribution retirement plans. Um, so I, I don't know how many um, how many of you all have have worked on in defined contribution and retirement plan space, um, but just wanted to give a, a little bit of some of the landscape of what we're seeing right now. Um, again, Jen and I are not <laughs> retirement professionals; that are, we're not wealth our our wealth practice. Um, but I, when I was a, a client of Mercer's um, a few years ago, I, I had Mercer uh, advise my group on 
on the wealth space on our, our 403B plan. Um, and it's, it's pretty impressive. So I'll, I'll see, I'll see what I can share if I can share any personal anecdotes from, from the impressive, impressive pieces. Uh, so of course at Mercer, we always focus on the uh, compliance and what is going on in the law. Um, so secure 2.0 is a recent bipartisan uh, piece of legislature um, around mandatory automatic enrollment, delaying required minimum contributions, and increasing catch-up contributions. So we saw this in the health space as well. Uh, with COVID, um, taking the, you know, our, our, our lawmakers use this as an opportunity to pay attention to what's currently in place. How can we adjust that in order to give Americans the most advantage uh, for the contributions and tax savings uh, that's available to them through our laws? So this Secure 2.0 is a hot topic right now for employers, uh, specifically in defined contribution space. Um, we're seeing that plan sponsors are exploring offering ability to the ability to contribute to a 401k account linked to emergency savings to help employees. Again, considering the tumultuous times that we're all living through. Um, I don't think I've ever said unprecedented more than I've ever said in the last couple months uh, that I've ever said in my entire life, but unprecedented times. Um, financial wellness is a particular point where we're seeing um, other employers wanting wanting to to dive dive and develop resources into uh, to keep their folks safe, strong, and secure. Pooled employer plan regulations. So this is kind of sort of similar gen to, to ASG in a way. Um, we're seeing we're seeing this um, on the retirement side. So having a pooled employer plan or a group of employers that pull together to create one combined retirement plan. So kind of kind of sort of in the association association space. Um, this is another hot topic. And then last but not least, we're seeing cryptocurrency in DC plans. Um, Another thing, unprecedented, and I think Bitcoin or cryptocurrency are, are, is another word that I, I don't think I ever would have imagined that I'd, I'd say so many times in my life, but in the last couple of months, I've said it a million times. Um, we don't recommend that employers involve cryptocurrency into their defined contributions plans, but it's something that we're starting to see as an investment, investment option uh, being offered. So again, we have more survey data. I went ahead and grabbed survey data on um, from our plan sponsor defined contribution survey for the pharmaceutical industry, specifically looking at micro plans. So with employers with less than $5 million in assets, um, and we have five respondents here that we're looking at. So it's not a huge, large amount of folks, but we didn't have a uh, life sciences category. So I figured pharmaceuticals was perhaps the best that we could, we could get, the closest we could get, just to give you a sense of your peers and, and what other folks are doing. So what type of defined contribution plan is your organization offering? So by and large, we're seeing 401k uh, as, the, as the, the type of defined contribution plan that's being offered. No 403b as it wouldn't be a nonprofit. Um, profit sharing also being up there. Um, I'm not sure what the other category is, but I can find out if anyone's interested. Um, so traditional defined contribution, also offering health savings accounts as an option and then equity comp with stock stock options if uh, they're publicly traded. For employer matching, did your organization offer matching contributions to participants? Um, it looks like yes, um, almost a 50-50 split, 60-40 with yes and no. And then the effective match rate. Um, so we're seeing, we saw 51% to 99% of the first 6% of your salary being the, the match rate. Um, for for this size for the micro plans. So that's it as it comes to health, wealth, career, the three major kind of aspects and assets of um, the total rewards and trends that we're seeing for employers, what they're focusing on. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to Jen just to talk a little bit more about Bio and Mercer. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about our relationship um, and hopefully we can answer any questions that you might have um, as it pertains to the ASG. So Jen, over to you. Thanks, Leanna. So Leanna shared a lot of information about trends and we often saw throughout this, um, the idea of small employer and definition of small employer is up to um, truly your definition. And there are some legal definitions that define that in the health insurance marketplace. And so when we were working with bio originally, 
we were they were really looking to focus on providing a healthcare solution to the quote unquote small employer. The legal definition of small employer is two employees to 50 in most states. A handful of states actually have defined it up to 100. But the goal was really to provide uh, a solution for, for those small employers that, you know, you guys wear a lot of hats, you do a lot of things, a lot of good things. And sometimes, you know, looking at finding health insurance or a partner to get you through what is a very complicated um, and, and difficult area and in industry uh, is challenging. And so you're looking for a partner to help you through that process. And, and Bio and Mercer and now Air, Bio, um, I'm sorry, Arizona Bio are teamed up together to, to really bring you a solution that can help you all navigate through that health insurance market. Uh, so let's get into just describing what it is today and maybe even get to share a little bit of good news about where we're going to be in the very near future. We refer to this as our affinity small group solution and really what this is our small group plan. So think again that uh, typically under 50 employees is what is going to be eligible for the small group solution. Today we have it sit, sat at at least five enrolled. So you need at least five enrolled in order to participate in the small group plan, but we're really pleased to be able to share and um, it, it's not publicly aware uh, at, at this point, but we're going to share it today because we're really excited and we have your attention. Um, but we will be in the very near future able to bring this solution down to two enrolled employees. So two enrolled employees up to 50 employees will be eligible for this um, before the end of the year. So more information will be coming out to all of you um, about this expansion of the program. Uh, today also we're, we're solely working with United Healthcare, which has been a great partner. But another piece of the expansion is that we'll be able to offer more than just United Healthcare as far as quoting. We'll be able to take a look at rates um, from a multitude of large carriers. So think of you know, the Blue Cross Blue Shields or Anthems of the World, Cigna's and Humana's, things like that, um, in addition to United Healthcare. And that'll give us an opportunity to really find what, what works for you and your employees. You know, but prior to this, you know, we've looked at a lot of statistics and that's, you know, small employer, large employer group. And I did a little bit of research. There's one other really major um, survey that's out there with the Kaiser Family Foundation. It's uh, also a great place to go for information. They also have some focus on the smaller size. So thinking of that two to 50. And I did some research just to see, you know, in that small category, how many employers are really offering health insurance? Um, because there's no legal obligation. When you get up to 50 employees or plus, you know, there's really almost legal obligation or you're penalized for not offering health insurance. But the 2019 studies say that there's about almost 31% of small employers, again, two to 50 are offering health insurance. And then I looked, dug in a little bit further into Arizona and it's just about 28% are offering health insurance. So this gives you an opportunity to really be uh, an employer uh, of choice and, and bring in the idea of benefits and that total rewards package to attract and retain your employees, you know, is something that Mercer Bio and Arizona Bio are all wanting to bring to the table for, for each of you. Today, we have medical, dental, vision, and basic life insurance uh, that's available, and that will continue to be available as the solution expands. And the really great thing is that we can do this all via web-based platforms. Um, if any of you are like Leanna and I, we sit at our computers um, for most of the day, and it gives us an opportunity to engage in, with a sales agent uh, and with the, the system all the way through from the beginning of quoting and getting the rates for your employees and look at, looking at the different plans all the way through open enrollment is all done on a web-based platform. And, you know, I always like to tell the story of, you know, when open enrollment comes around, I can take my cell phone, my iPhone and go sit next to my husband on the couch and we can go through on the mobile app and decide what benefits we want. And it just really gives your employees the opportunity um, to be efficient and effective um, and, and do what they need to at work, but then come home and make those decisions for themselves and their family uh, and really do it, you know, when it's most convenient for them. But it also for as an employer, 
this allows you to do it when it's most convenient for you. So as I mentioned before, I know you guys wear a lot of different hats and um, being able to sit down and, and work through health insurance uh, may not be something you can fit into the normal day, but you will have access to be able to go through the coding process um, again on the couch with your laptop if you want while you're, you're binge watching your favorite show. Um, the other important piece here is that we do provide member um, and employee support. So for all of you, as you go through that coding process, uh, as you move through and your employees begin their open enrollment process, there's a lot of support there. Um, it really is there to ensure, again, that if there are questions your employees have about adding a spouse or um, adding a dependent or making a change, there are folks there that can help support that employee through that process and take that lift and off of the shoulders of whomever in your office is typically running those benefit plans. Um, the other thing that's really important, especially as the solution grows and you'll have access to more carriers, if you do choose a medical dental and vision program, for example, and you have three different carriers, our system takes all the information. So any enrollment, any changes mid-year, and you, you make those changes in that enrollment on one platform, and then it, we take that information and send it to all three carriers. Without this solution, you would have to go into the systems of every single carrier and make those enrollments and make those changes. So again, really bringing some efficiency to the space, which oftentimes, especially for a small employer, is not available and it really is kind of a clunky process. Uh, so Leanna, let's just go on to the next page. And I've talked a little bit about some of these already. Um, this, the process is simple. Uh, we use it, Leanna and I use it as we enroll. It's you know a very fluid uh, process that allows you to go through the steps on your own. It's self-serve. But again, you have that support, as I mentioned, from both a kind of a broker or a sales agent from Mercer, as well as a, a support team for your employees. The other important piece is choice. So, you know, when we at Mercer look at structuring health plans for our employers of all shapes and sizes, the one thing that has really come to light over the last decade probably is you might have a wide range of employees that have very different needs. You know, I think back to when I was younger and felt more healthy, <laughs> uh, I would only need a high deductible health plan. I, did, I just, I barely went to the doctor. I didn't need the rich PPO that my partners in my law firm all wanted. I, I just needed to, you know, have something there in case something went wrong. So being able to offer both that richer PPO plan for, you know, those that might want that, but also providing choice to your employees that may not need that. So offering a high deductible health plan, that really changes, you know, that value proposition that you're bringing your employees as well. You know, also cost savings. These are small group plans that are filed by the state, but where we start to see those cost savings is, is really going back to that choice option. When you offer more choice, the employers and the employees save. So rather than have all of your employees in a more expensive, rich plan, having the opportunity to have more choice can ultimately drive some cost savings because those, those premium dollars uh, start to come down if you have that choice uh, within the plan options. The one thing I would just want to point out here through the partnership with Arizona Bio and Mercer and, and Bio Business Solutions, uh, all of this online enrollment, HR admin portal and the customer service is provided at no additional cost. It's built into uh, the, the services that we provide through the commissions that Mercer receives. So we're really pleased to be able to offer you this additional um, benefit and solution that you wouldn't have access to typically if you were out there on your own. And it's also, you know, really a Fortune 500 benefit. It's, it's something that all, most large employers have, most small employers do not. So we're excited that we can offer this to you. So how do you get a quote? Uh, you know, working through, I'm sure many of you know, Pete Fry and his team, um, going through them and contacting them, that is, um, the first and foremost way to do it, an alternative, um, and typically Pete and his team will then reach out to the Mercer team and we'll connect you with the sales agent. There's also a website that's been built that you can go and get a quote there as well. But 
most importantly, just so you know, when we when you get into the system, there's some basic information that's necessary for any insurance company to provide a quote. So knowing that in advance might be helpful and maybe um, squash any sort of frustrations because you know that you'll need some of this information. And that information is just basic company information to set up a profile. When do you want to start coverage? So that's going to be important. Are you going to start coverage January 1? Are you going to start coverage April 1, June 1? Uh, you have an opportunity to come in and receive quotes and begin coverage whenever it's most convenient and important for, for each of you. You don't all need to come in at one time. And then you'll need to pick an open enrollment start date. So for example, if you're going to start coverage on January 1st, maybe you'll start your open enrollment sometime at the beginning of December, end of November. You pick what's most convenient for you and your team. Um, and then we'll have to, the most important thing, and often sometimes the most frustrating, um, is providing the census information. And this is the key piece. The health insurance companies, in order for them to give you any sort of rates, need to know who's going to be enrolled on the plan. So you're going to need to gather a little bit of information to find out who of your employees either will be eligible or you likely uh, will assume will be enrolled in the plan. That can always change as you get through open enrollment, but just having that information up front so that we can receive those quotes back for you on your behalf of all of your employees and their dependents is important. So gathering that information and getting ready to rock and roll when you get into the system or working with that sales agent is going to be important. So just one last clarification. I think I saw um, a, a question come in. It says, what, which are the requirements for joining the Affinity Solution? Is it available to small, all small companies or technology or is a membership with Arizona Bio required. I'm working with a number of startups, but some are not life science companies. Um, I can answer this, Pete. If you want to answer it too, feel free to jump in. Uh, but this is this right now is set up for um, members of Bio uh, or Arizona Bio or any of the other affiliates that are participating in the plan. Um, so that's typically the the baseline. And then of course, we're looking at two to 50. It does not have to be, you know, a, a technology or a bio specific, but you do need to be a member uh, of one of these associations. So Pete, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. No, you hit it on the head there. The connectivity with Arizona bio has to be made, but you, you uh, summed it up perfectly. So I think that's all we had on our end. Um, is that right? Is that the last one, Leanna? Great. So I don't know if there are any other questions. <laughs> Looks like we've got, oh. I'm coming back. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yes, we do have some more questions. And one of the questions that we have um, has to do with um, how our life science companies tend to grow not just in Arizona, but across the country and even around the country, uh, across the world. So mm -hmm. how does it, how does the plan work for multi-state employee bases or maybe even multinational employee bases? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so most of the carriers will start with multi-state. So mo most of the carriers will really look to the headquarters of the organization as where you locate the plan and then that they have national networks that would allow those groups in other states, those employees in other states to participate in that plan. Alternatively, some groups as they get larger will offer two different plans in those two different locations. It just depends on the size and then, you know, of course there's some administration things that have to be considered um, de so depending on your overall strategy as a group and what your needs are, you might have it under one plan, you might have it under multiple plans. Um, and again, that's something that at Mercer we do every day. We work with employers of all shapes and sizes to help navigate what might be best for the employers that are in those situations. As far as any group that might be, have multinational that has groups outside or employees outside of the US, this right now, 
and I will never say it won't ever grow, but right now this is really focused on US-based employees. Um, we always will look to expand and bring a solution for our employers that have and the members that have employees outside of the US. And at Mercer, we again, we do that all the time, but this particular solution as it's, as it's designed today does not expand into offering coverage to folks that are outside the US. If you have any of those unique needs, please let us know and we can see if we can provide any assistance through other channels at Mercer. And, uh, you know, this, as I mentioned, is we help employers in that situation quite regularly. Terrific. And so as the um, companies are going through and they're following the process, right, they're making sure they're AZ Bio members. They're connecting with Pete. They're looking <laughs> at the website. They're doing the different steps that they go through. When do they start communicating with their employees that they're starting to go through this process? Well, they can really communicate at any point. Um, so one of the things a lot of our employers might do in advance, of, especially if they're not offering insurance today, or even if they are offering insurance today, is, is to, to get a pulse on what's going right or what are you looking for uh, that begins an open dialogue and conversation about what sort of plans the employer might want to offer um, at that point you go through the process you begin uh, getting the rates and the quotes and picking the plans and as i mentioned is in the process you'll pick an open enrollment period that open enrollment period is when the system will then send out emails to your employees to say it's time for open enrollment. Here's how you go about making those elections. Sign into the site and then you can begin the election. So I, I think if I was thinking about this as an employer, there could be multiple times in which you communicate with your employees. That message might be different depending on the timing. Um, but as, as soon as the plans have been selected, I would probably start making some communications known to the employees to say, look out for this email, let's make sure that everyone sees it, and this is what we're doing as an organization, and it's powered through, you know, our relationship with Arizona Bio and Mercer, and, and make sure that you can, you, you get that email in front of you and begin the enrollment process. The other thing that um, we didn't really touch on, but there is an HR admin portal that as you know, you pick a, let's say a 10 day window for open enrollment, you as the employer can log into the system and see what employees have started the process, what employees still haven't started the process. There are reminder emails that are sent out to the employees to say, hey, you've got three more days to do open enrollment or today's the last day, but it also allows you as an employer to keep track of, of who has gone through that process, who hasn't, and maybe give them a little nudge. So another question that has come up is small group plans. One of the concerns that employers have with small group plans is you could have a relatively healthy population. And then somebody has premature triplets and you go totally out of whack on your calculations. How can a small company protect themselves for those unexpected occurrences? And, and why does something like that impact my insurance at all? Lena, I don't know if you wanna take this or I can give a little bit of a shot at it. Um, so in the small group market, uh, you know, you're, you're rated based on, in, in every state pursuant to the Affordable Care Act, you're rated by your age and gender. Um, from that, so it's very limited on how the underwriting can work in a small group plan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the insurance carriers will look year over year as to what that book of business did in that particular plan that you were enrolled in. And I've seen, shockingly, I've seen very small increases and I have seen mm -hmm. eye-opening increases. And quite frankly, it may not even have to do with what you and your plan did. It had to do with the overall book of business and what that plan did. Um, so those are just, um, you know, the protection is supposed to be there for, for smaller employees to be based not on your experience, but on your age and gender. 
Um, so, you know, sometimes it's that's an unusual uh, result, but it could have been based on a multitude of things that happened, not just to that employer, but to other employers that were participating in that same plan. And that that insurance company then knocked up the rates pretty high in the renewal. So um, I don't mm -hmm. know, Leanna, if you have anything you would add to that. Uh, the small group, yeah. though, should be a little bit more protective than the larger group, and large being right. 50 plus. Yep. Yep. With the larger groups, you have things uh, for self-insured, like stop loss and, and think, you know, you have other sorts of protections in place. Um, but to Jen's point, I've seen some clients come in at a flat renewal uh, for the next year. And I've seen other clients come in at a 10 percent increase, 13 percent, 15 percent increase. Um, the other big thing, again, can't talk about a presentation in this day and age without mentioning it is COVID. Um, a lot of procedures were put off in 2020 and even into 2021. Um, so a lot of the projection that underwriters are doing is to anticipate some of these major costs that are going to be incurred. Um, so that's also why um, we are seeing a wide variety of, of rates and things uh, for the renewals as well. Is it anticipation of post-COVID procedures um, also people just weren't going to the doctor in general in the last year. So elective or not. Perfect. So today we have a plan that is open to employers with five or more enrolled employees. We're anticipating, um, you know, <laughs> and, and excited that the plan is going to be expanded. Um, so that we'll have more choices and it would be open to employers with two or more employees. Um, but I'm just getting started. And there's only one of us and we're trying to figure out how best to, you know, entice employees to join us in the future. What are some of the other options out there where an employer can have a healthcare option? So a couple of things, uh, you know, one, uh, and it would be, if, I'd be remiss if I didn't share this, but um, Mercer's working on, for example, an opportunity and I'm sure we'll be uh, role, talking about this further uh, within organizations like Bio and Arizona Bio, but we have the ability to um, offer a solution for first um, individual coverage so that's one way an employer can um, just provide access to somebody to assist them through that process. But uh, some employers and a lot of small employers, and this is something we hope to, again, expand on the solution one day soon, because it's been talked about a lot more, is to provide a, it's called, it's a HRA or a health uh, reimbursement account that an employer that's in, of a small size is able to offer just some dollars. So let's say $1,500, $5,000, whatever the number is that's selected. And the employee can then take that out to the public exchange and receive and, and use that those dollars for reimbursement for coverage out on the exchange. It's called an ICRA or an individual health reimbursement account. I'm forgetting what the, it all stands for. But those are those are pieces that for if you don't want to offer a quote unquote group health plan um, that a lot of employers are looking to just provide a bucket of money so that their employees can go out and get what they need. Uh, so that's one thing that I would say is another option, Joan. Um, otherwise, you know, that individual marketplace, um, quite frankly, I've seen employers just throw some extra cash on their employees checks, mm -hmm. um, you know gross it up for taxes and give them a little bit of money that quite frankly, can't actually control how they spend it. Uh, but right. they, you know, tag it for, make it purposefully known that that money is designated for health insurance. And then of course they can use it as they see please. But um, that's another thing I've seen smaller employers and how they tackled uh, trying to offer some assistance without having to organize a group health plan. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at our questions in the chat and you guys did such a tremendous job that you've answered all the questions. 
<laughs> um, That's great. So, so with that, um, I want to just give um, each of our speakers the opportunity to do just one closing thought, you know, that you would like people, if they're going to take anything away from this presentation, what would it be? Leanna, you want to start? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, data is important. Data is key. Uh, data is useful to us um, here at Mercer and to our clients. So if there are data points, trends, um, issues that you're worried about, curious about, you want to learn more, um, please just let me know, let Jen know. Uh, Pete, I'm going to volunteer you as well <laughs> um, to connect uh, so that we can, we can definitely get that information over to you just to have that knowledge is power mentality um, so you can provide the best possible solutions to your, to your folks. Uh, and mine, you know, I would just say very important, stay tuned. Uh, we've got a lot of good things coming down the pipe from Bio Business Solutions in Arizona Bio. Uh, and, and the solution that we're going to be able to offer you all from a health insurance perspective is going to be something that's not available elsewhere. And, you know, having this opportunity to have the support, to have options to really create a plan that is meaningful and useful to your employees will be available very, very soon. So being able to look at those different carriers, looking at all the plan options that are out there, um, there's a lot out there for you to navigate through, but you're gonna have support in doing so. Um, and then on the back end, having that really efficient system uh, for you to be able to select the plans your employees to enroll and for you to go through and administer the plan. So stay tuned for more really great and exciting things coming your way uh, with, as it relates to the health insurance solution that's being offered. And with that, I want to turn um, back to our community and extend a huge thank you to Leanna and to Jen for all of this great information today. And uh, make sure that you have it on the schedules to join us next month for the next session of AZ Bio Peers. Thank you, Leanna. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Mercer. Thank you, Bio, for giving <laughs> us the opportunity to um, share this program with our members and help them take care of the employees that are taking care of all of us.